Welcome to Evil Live, the live media commentary show that answers the question, is there a preferred age to sell your soul to the devil? Subscribe if you're new to the channel because today we are reviewing The Rise of the Dragon, an illustrated history of the Targaryen Dynasty, Volume 1. Now, you all know that I'm a House of the Dragons fan. I, after watching that just first season, I'm blown away. I'm chomping at the bit for the next season. And so I sort of put it on my wish list of wanting to pick this volume up. And this is sort of a companion to the world of Ice and Fire that I've already reviewed on this channel, which is an illustrated guide to the history of Westeros, the, the whole Game of Thrones universe. And this is really much more of the first half of the 300-year Targaryen dynasty. It's really sort of the, the vibe that we're getting from this. So this is by George R.R. R. Martin, of course. Elio M. Garcia Jr. and Linda Antinson. Antinson? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Messing it up, Linda. But anyway, those are the original three that did the World of Ice and Fire as well. So uh, this was published by 10 Speed Press, different printer than last time, but it was released October 25th, last year, 2022. Now, again, this is uh, focusing in part of the uh, Fire and Blood uh, novel that was released about the history of House um, House Targaryen. And again, it's really sort of the first half of it. Now, when I saw that this was going to be released, I'd already read A World of Ice and Fire, and so I just assumed it would be a lot more information about the history of the Targaryens. What I didn't realize was that actually this volume is just from Aegon the Conqueror coming over, conquering the Seven Kingdoms in Westeros, which we got in World of Ice and Fire already. And it comes all the way through to the Dance of Dragons and ends at the beginning of the broken reign of the broken king, Aegon III. And so I'm sort of like battering around in my head, how could this possibly be different than what I've already read? Now, certainly, if you've read the novel Fire and Blood, there's no reason to pick this up unless you want to check out some of the illustrations, of which there are many good ones. I will say this, though. The illustrations in this particular collection pale in comparison, by and large, to the World of Ice and Fire volume. I, I don't know why they went with different illustrators or, you know, maybe they just couldn't get the, the same ones. You know, there's a time crunch issue or whatever. But some of these are just not good. And that's a bummer because the illustrations in the original uh, uh, the History of the World of Ice and Fire book, th they were amazing. They were completely stellar. These, not so much. There's, there's some great ones, but for the most part, I was disappointed. And really, when you're buying something like this, which is a big old coffee table book sized book, you want it you're getting it because you want those beautiful illustrations, you know, the, the full design pages and everything. It, otherwise, just get the novel. Like, there's no reason to get this if you've already read the novel or you own the novel, other than the illustrations. And so, not only is this not what I wanted, I want the Targaryens from Valyria. I want a volume that talks about old Valyria. That is the only thing I care about as far as the Tar Targaryens are concerned because everything else has already told us about them. So I don't, I just don't care that much. I was really frustrated that this didn't cover old Valeria and that Fire and Blood didn't cover old Valeria. Like, what do we have to do, George? <laughs> Seriously, hook a brother up. I need those stories. I want to be a, a character in old Valeria when shit starts hitting the fans and those, I think it was like seven different or nine different volcanoes start erupting and it destroys the entire area. But then it's also like what happened after it was destroyed? Because ultimately there's still like diseases and stuff present because one of the princesses is, uh, gets on uh, one of the dragons, I can't remember which one it was, and actually goes to old Valeria, comes back and she's all diseased and only lives for a little while and dies and then the dragon dies shortly thereafter as well. So something is there in Old Valeria. I want to know. 
And there's so much about the world of ice and fire, not just the continent of Westeros, but all of the other uh, islands and archipelagos and land masses that have yet to be revealed that were teased in World of Ice and Fire that I also really want to learn more about. Give me some stories in those eras or, or flesh them out a little bit more rather than just one or two sentence mystery based, uh, you know, uh, little synopses. That being said, focusing on this volume again. Um, again, it begins with the conquest, which is Aegon the Conqueror forming the Seven Kingdoms. And there's a little bit of iffy, whiffy bullshit about the Seven Kingdoms. Really, it was six, but they sort of, you know, do a tongue-in-cheek reference to that. Because Dorne is the Seventh Kingdom. And Dorne doesn't become a part of the Seven Kingdoms until after this volume. In the next volume, there's going to be another king that actually brings them into the fold. But that's, you know, more than a hundred years after Aegon conquered it. So I don't know why they're referencing the Seven Kingdoms at this point. So it talks about the reign of Aegon I, which was dope. Uh, Aenys I, which is okay. Magor I, Magor the Cruel, which was brutal, very short-lived. Jaehaerys I, which lasted arguably the longest and was the most peaceful and prosperous. Jaehaerys was the one that actually built the King's Road to connect all the different kingdoms. And he actually fleshed out Old Town, he fleshed out um, all around the, the Red Keep, and he sort of, you know, had people uh, tax uh, incoming trade and, and high expense, high dollar value items in order to build up the treasury, uh, because at that point it had been extinguished, basically. Um, and he's sort of that golden era of Targaryen reign, where people reflect fondly in those times. He was the one that had to make the decision between Viserys or Rhaenys to be the, his successor, which is the very beginning of the House of the Dragon HBO series. And one thing that you always notice about this is that this takes many more cues from Fire and Blood than it did House of the Dragon. And I bring that up because in Fire and Blood, there are um, unreliable narrators telling the story of the Dance of the Dragons, um, and arguably the entire story, right? So you don't really know what is true and what is not, because different people, there's three different narrators that are giving you three different versions of a story. Well, they continue that in this, and what I always thought was strange was that I believed that it was announced the actual series was going to be the true account. So since this came out after the series, I thought it would reflect the true account of what we witnessed rather than three different versions that neither of them fully line up with the version that we were shown. That's kind of a bummer. I mean, ultimately, when you're reading these stories, you don't want, as a fan, to have possible events, possible timelines. You want to know exactly what happened and when it happened. That's the whole strength of building history, is that you get to know the factual basis of it. And you can play the argument that it's much like our own history, where the victors write history and it's not always accurate to what actually happened, only what the victors want you to believe happened. And so perspective plays a, a big role, except even in our own history, at least we have that sort of blanketed, well, this is the history that it is. Maybe it's not true 100%, but that's what we all understand. In this, there's the three different versions. And so you don't even get the one blanket. You got three different blankets. I don't know which one's my whoopee. <laughs> Hook a brother up. It's frustrating. So anyway, learning all about Jaehaerys' reign I thought was really interesting. And then we get into Viserys' reign, which of course we watched through the series. And it is also a, a sort of a follow-through peaceful reign. But the decision to make Jaehaerys is what cemented the idea that women could not be the ruler of the seven kingdoms. They could not sit on the Iron Throne. It sort of set a precedent. And this was a precedent that was already set by the first men in the Andals, you know, in Westeros. But as far as the Targaryen dynasty is concerned, it was always sort of, you know, loosey-goosey up in the air until Jaehaerys made that ruling. And so that started what would be the contention of ultimately the whole Dance of the Dragons, which is the House of the Dragons series. Uh, that that bit of storyline of the Targaryen dynasty. So um, Viserys ultimately comes in. 
uh, he has a bunch of uh, kids. Not all of them live. Uh, he loses a wife, and then you know he sort of picks up a new wife from the old High Tower family, and that is the beginning of all the conflict because the High Towers want to, of course rule they want to have their family rule and um rhaenyra which is viserys's uh first and well surviving daughter uh surviving heir he named her the next to sit on the iron throne uh as the leading heir and he never changed his story so this entire time uh we're getting this conflict between the high towers and rhaenyra and we know that it's going to play through not only their lifespans, but also their children's lifespans. And what's really important to understand about this time frame of the Dance of the Dragons is that it's the most impactful and the most focused on in this volume. So all the history leading up to it, yes, we get a little bit more than we got in World of Ice and Fire, which is appreciated, but it's pretty much the same as you got in Fire and Blood. Dance of the Dragons is where we really get all that nitty-gritty nitty detail about, you know, Damon and Rhaenyra and Rhaenys and uh, um, uh, the... Um, <laughs> I can't remember now. Uh, I just finished reading this. Anyway, the other... the um, Valyria... Why can't, it's Targaryen and the... Um, I should have made notes. I didn't make notes, sorry. Anyway, there's two families that came over from Old Valeria. Um, uh, the Valerians, thank you. So it was the Valerians and the Targaryens, and it, you sort of get to like Corlys Valerian and stuff. You get to know their family history and, and everything like that a little bit more than you ever did with the series, uh, and more than I believe you did in Fire and Blood, but certainly more than you did in World of Ice and Fire. That being said, I did enjoy this section of it because it was like reliving the series through different lenses because, again, unreliable storytellers from three different sources. Uh, and then, of course, we get uh, the reign of Aegon II, which is the heart and blood of the Dance of the Dragons, you know, the, the High Towers versus Rhaenyra. Um, that's very tragic, and nothing good comes out of it. It is not only was the setup to it depressing and sad, the story of everything that happened within it, there is no good people, everyone's a bad person, and it all sucks, and it all ends in a big bummer. But that's kind of Game of Thrones 101, so you, if you like this series, then you clearly like that outcome, or at least tolerate it to some degree like I do. After Aegon II and the Dance of the Dragons, we get the regency of Aegon III. Now, this is Rhaenyra's son, um, who uh, ends up taking the throne, but he doesn't really want it. And, you know, he, his, his youngest brother sort of was uh, disappeared during the Dance of the Dragons. No one really knew what happened. He came back and it was, you know, this big deal. Um, Aegon III's wife killed herself, um, which, you know, was devastating. I believe his child killed his, herself. So he just has this terrible stigma over his uh, house in his reign. And then it ends right when he makes that sort of Dance of the Dragon precursor move like uh, the series did um, or the High Towers did where he spurns the wrong person and that's going to set up the Reign of the Broken King going forward in Volume 2 of this collection. So this was a very fast read. It's a very large book, but again, it's a large format book. It, the, the type setting is very large. It took me just a couple days to get through it, and, you know, I enjoyed it, so clearly I burned through reading it, but I don't know. I, I expected more out of this. I, I want, you know, if they're going to bring out a standalone coffee table book size volume, I was hoping that it would be as large in scope as World of Ice and Fire was. You know, I, I wanted more detail, I wanted more information, and it didn't really give it. That being said, what I did get, I did enjoy. And so it's this strange juxtaposition of wanting versus what I got and, you know, wanting more, getting less, but I enjoyed thoroughly what I got. It's a big frustrating thing. So that being said, I ended up giving this four out of five evil eyes. I did enjoy this book. It is not as good as The World of Ice and Fire, but it is good. So if you want to really dive into the nitty gritty of the Targaryen dynasty, you know, the first half of their time in Westeros, without reading Fire and Blood, 
I think this is a good alternative for you to explore that. But if you're a sort of fervent fan that wants more, you're not really going to get it from this volume. And that's a little bit of a bummer. So that's my review. Thank you all so much for tuning in. As always, remember that evil spelled backwards is live. So get your asses out there and be evil. Thank you.